So Curtis asked me to uh, share a little while back, and I had a very clear idea of what I was going to share on. And then a week and a half ago at our morning prayer, don't you love it? We have a God who meets us when we seek him. He changed that up a little bit. <laughs> so we're going to look at John 3.16 here to start off with. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. When we were praying, the Lord brought this verse to my mind, and he also brought three words to my mind to help me better understand it, then also communicate the truth more fully in this verse. There are three words, three parts of this verse. The first part, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The three words were wonder, worship, and witness. So wonder, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Worship comes in when he says that whoever believes in him. To believe, it's not just to believe he exists. It's to receive. Belief is a receiving of Christ. An act of adoration and obedience. And the third part, witness, shall not perish, but have eternal life. Eternal life is more than just living forever, someday in heaven. Eternal life is the type of life we've been given now in Christ as born-again believers. Something to witness now, for me to witness and for others to witness through me. So it's perfect communion with my creator God. This transforms us daily as we walk with him. So that's the summary of the three parts. We're going to unpack each a little more detail here. So back to wonder. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. What is the weight of this verse? Can we fully grasp what that means? That the God of the universe gave his only begotten Son for us. I was thinking about it as I was reflecting. God created the universe. He knows every hair on my head, on your heads. And not to get too scientific, but he's accounted for every single atom in the universe. Everything's created of atoms. There's, I don't know how many atoms in the universe. God knows exactly where each one is. He's composed it. He's put it all together. The Bible says, in him all things hold together. That God is the one who created us. And not only created us, but cares for us. So much so that he would redeem us. As I was thinking about amazing grace, what amazing grace that saved a wretch like me. Ephesians says, we are dead in our sins and trespasses in which we formerly walked and were by nature children of wrath. All we are deserving naturally is God's wrath. Yet he loved us. And it's not just this fluffy love. He gave himself to us for us. That's a truly amazing thing. I can be in perfect communion now with my almighty God, who is my father. And he said he so loved the world. His love is available to all. No strings attached. Absolutely no strings attached. He gave of himself. All he wants then is for us to receive him. That's a truly wonderful thing. It's an amazing thing that I can't fully wrap my mind around. And God's nature is he is perfect. First John says God is love. He always loves perfectly. Unlike me. Unlike a man. <laughs> I always love conditionally. I don't know about you. I'll be open and honest with you. I love people. I care for them. I like them. I do things for them. Because... It makes me feel good or I get something in return, whatever it might be. God is not like that. He gave himself no strings attached. 
And this is truly unexplainable. He gave his very life to us. It says earlier in John chapter 3, Jesus is speaking to a Pharisee, Nicodemus, who came to him at night to ask him what he's teaching. What is all this about? And he came at night, so he didn't want other people to know, but he's truly wondering. What is this message you have? I know you're a teacher sent from God. And then Jesus says in John 3, verse 8, He says this, The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it. But do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. And he had just said, you can't enter the kingdom of God unless you've been born of the Spirit. So the wind blows where it wishes, and you don't understand it, basically, is what he's saying. So it's unexplainable how this God of the universe has given us his Spirit to cause us to be born again to new life. And now that life lived is also unexplainable, a life lived by the Spirit. So if we've received Christ, we won't fully understand the life we're living. A truly wonderful thing. That's amazing to me. <laughs> Who would want to serve and worship a God we can explain? We can explain every little thing about him. That would be no God. That would be some, something of my imagination. Something that is lesser than me. If I can figure everything out about something, it's less than me. It's simpler than me. That's not our God. That's not the God who gave his only begotten son to us. Okay? Truly unexplainable. As I sat in wonder of this, my heart was prepared to worship. And the verse says that whoever believes in him. So that's a response to the sovereign work of God in giving his son. Worship is our response to this awesome God. And we're going to see that it's more than just singing songs. Worship is not singing songs on Sunday morning. We've been talking about that recently. And actually in the next chapter of John, chapter 4, he talks about how true worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth. So there's a spiritual encounter we have with God according to his truth. All I have to do is believe in him. That is to receive. It's to receive this new life, born again by the Spirit. A supernatural life now that he's given us. And it's to believe who he says he is. To believe that what he has said is true. That his promises he's made will be fulfilled, both past, present, and future. We can actually see that in the Bible. That's amazing. If you look at the prophecies in the Bible, they have been fulfilled. Many of them. There's never been a false prophecy in the Bible anyway. There's some that have yet to be fulfilled. But we can be certain that God's word is true. Amen? I heard one person say amen. Who believes that? <laughs> So he's given us eternal life. That's his life. Past, present, and future. And I was thinking about the whole belief. Worshiping is not just believing. Because the demons also believe and shudder, it says in the Bible. The demons believe and know that Jesus is the Son of God. But they're completely in, in rebellion. Satan believes that Jesus is the Son of God. The difference is that they are in rebellion against God. So worship is a lifestyle of obedience to God. It's a receiving of him. It's a changed life now by the power of the Holy Spirit. Again, another reference earlier in John chapter 1 verses 12 and 13. It says this. As many as received him, that is Christ, to them he gave the right to become children of God even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So again, the belief is a receiving of him. Born of God, that is a new life by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's eternal life. As I was thinking about 
what Jesus says in John chapter 3. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It's interesting if you read context around verses, because this is a verse we have all heard before, right? It's one, it's probably the first one a lot of us memorized at whatever age we memorized it. Looking at the context is important, though. Right before John 3, 16, Jesus says this, verses 14 and 15. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. He's referencing a specific account there with Moses and Old Testament Israel in the wilderness. The people have been freed from Egypt. God has demonstratively shown himself and delivered them out of slavery. Now they're in the wilderness. God feeds them with manna. They're constantly complaining. Moses is saying, what am I going to do about these people? They're, uh, they're a stomach ache to me, essentially. <laughs> they give me an ulcer. And then in a particular place, God sends fiery serpents in their midst. You know, they had made this golden calf. They were worshiping idols, continuing in their rebellion. And the reference there is the bronze serpent. Moses is interceding for the people. God, have mercy on them. So he tells him to make a bronze serpent, put it on a staff, so that anyone who looked at it could be healed from the poison that's in them from the snakes. That is a foreshadowing for us of what Christ has done. We all have the nature of a snake, folks. The poison of the snake is in our blood. That's rebellion against God. So the people in the wilderness had to understand that they were poisoned, that they needed mercy. Then they could go look at the snake. It was them recognizing something about themselves. That's me on that staff. I'm as good as that snake. Christ came in the flesh to put the flesh to death to give us new life. So worship, it's not just believing who he is, but it's also believing what he has said about who we are. And receiving that truth and living a changed life by the power of his spirit. Again, turning from that former life to live by the spirit, born again. That's our worship. And I was thinking about a definition of worship based on all this. So yeah, the bronze snake healed the people's bodies in the wilderness. Jesus heals our soul. We are utterly depraved apart from him. Right? We're in utter need of a Savior. To worship him is to love him in wonder of his great love for us. It's simply that. A relationship with our creator God, our Lord and our Savior. As we live out that life, changed by the Holy Spirit, that's the eternal life that we've received in Christ. It is something we have to learn how to live. And that's what, where our witness comes in. Eternal life is a present experience in light of a future hope. The future hope in God's kingdom, we're going to fully experience and know what it means to have eternal life. It's something for us to experience and participate in now. I witness God's faithfulness in my own life. So witnessing, it's not just, I'm not just talking about me going telling people about Jesus. It's this changed life. The power of a risen, resurrected life in Christ in me. He's demonstrating that to me, but also to others. I share that in not always in ways I understand or realize. We need to intentionally share it. That's why we have all these opportunities that Shane read about. We need to intentionally witness, but it should be something that we are constantly witnessing. It's not just I go out Saturday afternoon and witness. It should be a constant experience. Okay. Then as we witness, it looks like being a good lis listener. It looks like showing God's character to people, being unselfish with my time and all this. We're going to get into more application here at the end, but I wanted you to start thinking about the witnessing being his life in us now. So a point I was seeing to boil down John 3.16 Eternal life is something to wonder at. Wonder leads to worship. Worship leads to witness. As we experience more and more the fullness of the eternal life in us. 
I was thinking of an illustration that shows the fullness of God's love and what it means to share in his eternal life. If you will, we're going to be in Luke 15 for a while, so go ahead and open up and follow along. In Luke 15, Jesus tells three parables. The first one is a, the parable of a man who has 100 sheep. He loses one. He leaves the 99 to go find that one out of his love for that sheep. He finds it. There's great rejoicing. He invites all his family and friends. They throw a party. And Jesus interprets this parable for us. He's saying that there is more joy in heaven over a sinner who repents than 99 righteous persons who have no need of repentance. The second parable is a parable of a woman who lost a coin. Again, she, she loves this coin. It's valuable to her. So she searches high and low. She finds it. There's rejoicing and she throws a party. Just like the man with the sheep. And Jesus interprets this as there's more joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So Jesus is clearly connecting the lost things that were found to sinners who repent. And right before he tells those parables, we see something. Jesus is receiving tax collectors and sinners, the lowest of the low in that society. And then the Pharisees and scribes, the Jewish religious leaders, are trying to accuse him. He's, they say, oh, he receives tax collectors and sinners and eats with them. And then he responds by telling these parables. It's pointing out his love for the lost. The third parable paints an even more vivid picture for us. In light of those three groups of people, Jesus, the tax collectors and sinners, and the religious elite, or the self-righteous. So the parable of the prodigal son. And he said, A man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country and he began to be impoverished. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. He gladly would have filled his stomach with the pods the swine were eating, and no one was giving anything to him. But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? But I am dying here with hunger. So I will get up. I will go to my father, and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So he got up. And he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off. His father saw him. And felt compassion for him. And ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him. Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. Come, bring the fatted calf. Kill it. Let us eat and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. Now the older brother was out in the field. He came and approached the house and he heard music and dancing. So he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things could be. And he said to him, Your brother was returned. Your father has killed the fatted calf because he he's received him back safe and sound. 
But he became angry and was unwilling to go in. And his father came and began pleading with him. And he said to his father, Look, for so many years I have been serving you. And yet you have never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. Yet when this son of yours came, who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. The father said to him, Son, you have always been with me, and all that I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live. He was lost and has been found. So ends the parable. It's interesting. This parable Jesus does not interpret for us. He's bringing his immediate audience to a decision. He's pointing something out, especially to the Pharisees and scribes we're going to see. Before we go too in-depth in the details, let's summarize the action. It's a long parable, so let's go through the opening scene, the first couple verses. The younger son asked for his inheritance. If you think about that for a moment, an inheritance is something he would have received upon his father's death. So the son is thinking, oh, it's better for my father to be dead. I just want his stuff. His father is as good as dead to him. He has no relationship. And the son is as good as dead to the father when he leaves. He's not interested in a relationship with the father. Yet the father is gracious and grants him his wish. Then the distant country scene. Verses 13 through 19. So the younger son ventures off, spends everything, and falls on hard times. Then he does everything he can to sustain his life in that distant country. He doesn't want to go back yet, so he hires himself out. This really stinky job, literally, you know, working with pigs. And he's still impoverished. He still does not even have his basic needs met. And there's something that he finally realizes. Life is with the Father. He's as good as dead apart from the Father. Life is with the Father. So he decides to humble himself and see if the Father will even receive him back as a servant. There's something he realized. Just how unworthy he was, and still is, of living with his father. But he'll do anything he can to have a right relationship again. And then the next scene, it's the return of the prodigal son. The younger son comes to the father, and while the son is still far off, the father sees him and runs to him. Now, this in the culture would have been seen as inappropriate. The father could have just kicked him to the street and said, hey, you have no right in doing what you did. Well, what does the father show? What a great love and a humility. He actually runs out. <laughs> and he spares no expense in celebrating the return of his son. If he was looking for him a long way off, that also shows me something. He was always looking for the son's return. <laughs> That's what was on his mind. Looking for the son's return. He doesn't care about how hurt or worried he was. He doesn't care about himself. He just is glad that the son is now back with him. And if you notice too, just how excited he is, he cuts off the son mid-thought. The son doesn't get a chance to finish his whole spiel that he had memorized. He doesn't get to say the part about, no, make me as one of your hired men. He's just glad to have his son back. The father is. He has true repentance. Repentance is to turn from a former life back to God. In this case, that former life was leading to death. True life is with the father. And then you have the older son plot thickens. 
When the older son finds out about the younger son's return and the father's celebration, he's more than indifferent. He actually gets angry. What's that about? He doesn't even want to go near the house. So the father, out of his love for the older son, goes out and pleads with him. You can see here, again, about the father. He wants a relationship with both sons. Even the proud one, the self-righteous one. He wanted, the older son wanted recognition for his efforts. I've never neglected the command of yours, he said. But he did not have a relationship with the father. If he had understood the father with a relationship, he would have been looking for that younger brother of his. And he would have been happy when he returned. Don't you think? So this older brother's heart is not right. He also did not have a relationship with the father. As good as dead. Even though he was in the father's house doing work. So just like the younger brother was at the beginning. No relationship. He was simply interested in the father's stuff. You've never given me a young goat. But you remember the father div divided his wealth between them. Everything I have was yours, the father tells the older brother. But he's not content. How selfish. How self-righteous, thinking he deserves something better. And the father corrects his son thinking in two ways. First, he reminds the son that he has never held anything back from him. And then he also implores the son to realize the truth that apart from him, his sons are dead. The point I'm seeing in this whole parable is simply this. Jesus seeks the lost. He loved both brothers. True life is knowing him. True life is knowing Jesus, who always is seeking the lost. Same message as John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. He's always looking for your return. Making some further observations about the father. The father was always loving and gracious. He was always seeking a relationship with both sons. And they're both as good as dead apart from him. Now, observations about the sons. I was thinking about this in terms of before and after. You can look at both sons, and I was actually seeing four different types of people in this parable. The older son before and after. The younger son before and after. Though the younger son, at the beginning, was wretched and rebellious. He had a selfish heart within him. It was all about just feeling good about himself, doing what he wanted in life, you know, living this loose lifestyle, and rebellious. He didn't care about a relationship with the father. He was off on his own. Forget you. You're as good as dead to me, father. I don't care about you. In the end, though, after everything he experienced, he was wrecked and repentant. He was brought to the lowest of the low. Through his circumstances, he realized he's as good as dead apart from his father. He came to realize that, and then he was repentant. He turned back, humbled himself, not knowing what to expect. These represent the tax collectors and sinners in the parable, in the context. They recognize they need God's love. So a good question at this juncture is, do you recognize that? Anyone here who has not had a born-again experience, do you recognize that it's apart from God, you're as good as dead? But then, the older brother. These were the scribes and Pharisees, the religious leaders. Again, the Pharisees were those who had Scripture memorized, you know, the phylacteries, that had the Scripture in it. They did all the right things, said all the right things, were at all the right places at the right times in terms of their religious activity. Did not know God when he was standing right there in front of them, though. If they had a relationship with God, their father, they would have seen him in Christ. So at the beginning, the older brother was ignorant and indifferent. He had no understanding about who his father was, about his father's love. 
And he didn't care about his younger brother going off and squandering his life away. At the end, I would say it's not clear whether the older brother had a transformation of the heart. Jesus kind of trails off in the parable. He's asking the Pharisees and scribes, are you going to change? But at the end, he was informed. The father demonstrates his love for the younger brother by running out, meeting him, embracing him, kissing him, and throwing this extravagant party. But then he also goes out and reasons with the son. That's a demonstration of his love. And also explains his love. So now the older brother is informed about who the father is, but he's indignant. He's angry. He doesn't like it. He still wants recognition for his efforts. Self-righteous. These are people who have no wonder at God's love. Absolutely no wonder. <clears throat> so which son are you? Wretched and rebellious? Are you in a place where you have not received the Lord? You think you're okay in your own life and lifestyle? And there's something in your heart that's actually good. We are utterly depraved apart from Christ. Road that leads to death. Warning. Are you wrecked and repentant? Like the younger son at the end? Do you realize that you're as good as dead? There's no value in life in this world apart from Christ. And Jesus, or um, John actually says, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. So it's a lifestyle of repentance where I'm constantly turning to the Lord, asking for help. Are you like the older brother at the beginning, ignorant and indifferent? You think about uh, Revelation 3, the lukewarm church, how they were just don't really care about the things of God. They'll go through the motions. Are you informed and indignant? Do you not like what God has revealed to you about yourself or about him? Questions to ask yourself. As I was thinking about these two sons, the younger son is one who will do anything he needs to have a relationship with God. What a wonderful God we have. This awesome love that he would offer me his life. And then the older brother represents those who have filled themselves with other things. As I was reflecting on that specifically, a term came to my mind. I actually read a book recently by an author, Paul David Tripp. He writes a lot of books on Christian counseling and things like that. The particular book is How People Change. He uses this term, gospel gap, in his book. Basically means the period of time between when you came to believe and when you enter God's kingdom. Permanently, that kingdom of heaven, we see him face to face. How do we fill the gospel gap? I was thinking about this. Am I experiencing eternal life daily? Eternal life is what we should be experiencing daily. Wondering at God's love. Recognizing the internal truth that I am not worthy at all of his love. Then there's this idea of Christian externalism. Again, this is Paul David Tripp's wording. Basically misses the fullness of the eternal life in Christ. You put on a facade in various ways. One of these is formalism. You show up to every prayer meeting, every worship service, every so-and-so. You put on the right clothes, you say the right things. All this. But lack heart transformation. A true relationship with our Lord and Savior. Then there's mysticism. I'm sorry, legalism is next. It's in which a person is compelled to earn God's favor in some way by doing good things of any sort, as if we could better the offer he has already given of eternal life in his son, his only begotten son. <laughs> Do I actually think that? There's nothing better than the gift he's already offered. Just receive it. And then... We have this idea of mysticism. It's where I am going after this experience of God, this mystical encounter, 
without biblical commitment, without checking everything based on scripture. Sadly, there's a lot of churches that do that. There might be people here who do that. I don't know. There's points in time where in the past I could get into that thinking. Fortunately, I knew enough about the Bible where I caught that. Then there's this idea of activism. Activism is which a, a person is dedicated to this external cause, but they miss the truth of the internal reality of our need for a new life from God. It misses the point. Then there's this idea, a couple uh, invented terms here, of biblicism. Biblicism is, you know, become this theological expert. You know the Bible front and back, you know, like the Pharisees, you know, the memories, they had the phylacteries, which had the scripture on their frontals. It's kind of like turning the Bible into an idol. Rather than actually understanding the message, growing in Christ's character. Then there's this psychologyism. This is where the self-help gospel comes in. You know, I've received Christ so he can help me in this life. I can be a better person. I can feel better about myself and thereby contribute to this and that. Even help other people, you know. But that's not why he came and died. Why he gave his life. We will see ourselves transformed and we will see ourselves helping people. We will think better. But that's has to be in devotion to him, a real devotion. And there's this idea of socialism, not to be confused with the governmental economic construct. <laughs> Won't get into that right now, but uh, basically people receive Christ to be part of a church or a club to meet their social needs. So various ways, aspects of Christian externalism. But there's an internal truth we need to realize that the younger son realized in the parable. I am not worthy. I'm, I need your mercy, Heavenly Father. I want to receive your life. Help me live in light of your love. The ways we should fill the gospel gap then, I don't want to bring you down just with that. We'll give you some positive action steps here. Ways we should fill. In other words... What God expects of his children. And we'll come back to our three points here. The wonder, worship, witness. Wonder. Read scripture. Seems pretty straightforward, right? But not just reading it to know it. It's reading it to know him. To under him, understand him. Who we are in him. How he gave us this eternal life. How much he loves us. Seek to understand who this awesome God is. Meditate. Meditate basically just means to fill your mind with scripture. You can meditate even without a Bible cracked open. I know, I hear, I've given the excuse, and I've heard excuses from various people that I just don't have enough time. You know, I'm busy. I work, you know, 12 to 12 or whatever. Take a few minutes in the morning or whatever when you start your day, read a verse, one verse. Think about it the rest of the day as you go about your work. Look for the truth in that verse in your surroundings and how God is using everything to turn you and others to him. He is a God who will meet us when we seek him as we meditate on his word. Praise the Lord. Yeah, there's power. It's not just words on a page in this historical document. It's his breathed out words, his very character. So seeking, meditating, and then look to eternal life. Recognize how his life is working out in your life. How he wants you to change. So seeking him, it's not just about asking God for things. It's asking him, Lord, what do you want to do in my life, in me and through me? Think about his faithfulness in your life. Think about the promise of eternal life in his kingdom you have. What an awesome thing. He's always looking for your return. That's truly something wonderful too. If this is getting you down, thinking about some of this, remember how the father in the parable was constantly scanning the horizon, looking for his son's return. God is always looking for our return. 
We all mess up. We all stumble in various ways, right? None of us are perfect. God is always wanting to receive us back, embrace us, and help us to live a changed life. If you hear a condemning voice, it is not the Lord's voice. That is Satan, our enemy, who is going to lie to you and attack you. If you are in Christ Jesus, there's no condemnation. There are words of exhortation, but he says, Son, okay, get up. I'll walk with you. Watch out for that next time. Who's experienced that? Isn't it an awesome thing? And then the next point, worship. Receive the awesome gift of eternal life in Christ. This is our spiritual service of worship. The first time I came here, I preached on Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, by the mercies of God, present yourselves to God, a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So it's receiving his life. It's, it is a cognitive process. We need to be thinking, meditating, and always remembering who he is in his word what he's done in our lives. Turn from your wicked ways for good. He'll help us with this. Again, it's by the power of the Spirit. Pray for his help, for his healing of your heart. Don't remember past hurts. I sense there's a lot of people in here who have past hurts. Don't hold on to those. Give them to the Lord. He has overcome so that you can overcome that. We can overwhelmingly conquer. <laughs> that verse came up this last week in uh, Bible study, Romans 8. We can over overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. Okay? So ask him what his will is for you. Actively ask him. Don't think you have it figured out. Again, I thought a couple months ago I knew what I was going to preach on today. And it changed. That's one simple example. But the direction of your life might change. It might just be daily habits or routines that he wants you to change. It could be simple things. But constantly seek him. Ask for what his will is. And praise him in the good times and the bad. When we praise him, it forces us to think on his goodness. Not get down on our weakness. And failures, mistakes, and also what people out there are doing to us. It'll actually help us love those people. And that brings us to witness. We can experience the fullness of eternal life in Christ as we simply submit to him. We have a heavenly father, perfect in all his ways, creator of the universe. He's arranged all the atoms everywhere in this vast universe. He knows everything about us. So, let's seek to understand that. And we will experience his eternal life more now. We'll, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Well, we have that then in his presence, but also fellowship with one another. So just in a very practical way, make time for one another in the body of Christ. He uses that. That's a means of grace where we experience his life that we would share with one another. And also taking every opportunity to share with others, to witness very intentionally, reaching out to the lost. As we see him transform people's lives through our witness, we'll have an even greater wonder of this awesome God who can use a wretch like me. <laughs> I once was lost, but now I'm found. And that he can use me in an amazing way. He can use you in an amazing way beyond what you could ever imagine. If you would simply just say, here I am, Lord. Right? So praise the Lord that it's simple for us. Just receive. It starts with wonder. I really want to drive that home. Will we truly wonder at God's love? What an amazing gift of eternal life. Yeah, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Yeah, okay, I believe. I'm going to heaven. <laughs> Do you truly wonder at the truth of that verse, though? The weight, the depth of it. 
what he has done for us. He has given himself. So will we wonder at God's love, worship him, and witness his eternal life even now? It's not just a future promise, but a present experience. Amen? All right, let's reflect on that with our, our last bit here as the worship team comes up. We're going to sing one more song and take that time to reflect on eternal life. So Lord, we thank you for your eternal life that you've given us. We thank you that it's not up to us, not according to people who will and to work, but it's just a free gift. Help us to more fully understand that, to live it out, to be changed by you in every way. Help us to be like that younger brother in the parable that just simply says, I'm not worthy. And what an awesome celebration we're going to experience as we experience the fellowship of your spirit every time. Praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.